Yeah, these are sober, sobering days, beloved. I don't know why, but I feel like I'm supposed to start with something uh, a little different this morning. I was, I didn't plan on sharing this, but I feel I'm supposed to. So, thank you, Lord. My wife and I just returned from Florida, where uh, we were part of a family gathering for a memorial for my brother-in-law, who passed away very suddenly uh, at 71, which is very, very young, very young. Uh, he went to the doctors. He'd had some issues uh, with his stomach, went to the doctor. They felt like, okay, there's cancer, but they were going to create a plan. And, you know, that night he went home, never made it through the morning. So being there, also at this time, we're transitioning my mom into a, a memory care center. So it just was packed with lots of emotion, lots of, you know, challenge. And we have a tendency in our humanity to ask the why questions. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, we see somebody suffering and in hardship and we ask the perpetual question, how can a good God allow suffering? Come on, just being real. The lost, they ask that question all the time. And I want to speak before I get started about the issue of God's sovereignty. Because I'm not sure we're fully aware of what that means. So I want to just take a minute and speak to God's sovereignty in all things. Not a few. Because if he's not sovereign of all, he's not sovereign at all. Right? The one who has power to do anything at any time, that one is sovereign, even if he doesn't use his power. To withhold power is to possess it. There is an explanation, and it lies with the benevolent creator, and as his sensible secret, it's enough that he is I am. It's enough. Our mind gropes for explanation. I will trust if only I can understand, right? That's our humanity. I'll trust him if I can understand it. But by asking the question, we are demanding that God win not only our approval, but our consent. Ouch. Listen, if I were God, I'd make it all so crystal clear I'd explain myself so everybody would know that I love them and care for them. But God is not a God who stoops to get permission for his actions. Come on. When that terrible thing happens or that life crisis or the moment of hardship comes crashing in, it's his absolute dominion that's attacked. And our hope our hope is centered, rooted. The anchor is that the anchor of our soul is that he's good. And we never move from that place. When we move from that place, we're no longer anchored to who he really is. And we buy into a system of lies. And then we empower those lies because we believe them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. At this recent gathering, you know, I was asked, do you believe that God is sovereign? And I returned the question. I said, do you believe that he's sovereign? He said, I believe he's all powerful. I'll just think about this for a minute. Yeah, he's all powerful. We all agree, but sovereign, that's different. Sovereign is not the same as powerful. Powerful could, if it would, but sovereign is. You get the difference? If he's one less event shy of sovereign, he's not sovereign. We'd have to use a different word. The dictionary explains sovereign this way, paramount, supreme, 
complete independence and self-government. Sovereign is a word of absolutes. Though full explanation is beyond the comprehension of finite human minds, there is an answer. Explanation means I unveil my reasons. Answer means only that I have one. As he has an answer. And his answer is that I'm at, I am. God identified himself to Moses as I am. A strange way to say it. Nothing unsaid in the most amazing self-disclosure. God says it all. I am. I'm all I'm all there is, I'm all you need, I'm all, I'm anything, I'm everything, and I'm only sovereign. And it carried Moses from that moment forward in that revelation. Brings me to Abraham. Abraham. God will sovereignly accomplish what he asks of you all by himself. Think about this encounter with Abraham. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to rehearse the story. You know it. You know that Abraham is a man of great age. But a man must be called. He doesn't just choose his place in God's chronicles or the timing of it. Abraham had nothing to do with any of that. The pathway of his story is also mapped out by God, but not by himself. Abraham is singled out by God, chosen among heathen idolaters to know and follow, I am. To know by following, he was elected to a place, a time, and a particular demonstration of God, and so are you. I don't know why this is so important this morning, but I feel the weight of what I'm saying to you this morning. You need to understand that you and I have been called to follow, I am. He's sovereign. Maybe it's because of, of this uh, set of dreams that one was shared this morning, is that we're being prepared as the people of God for challenge and hardship like we've never known in the United States of America. There are believers around the world who have been suffering under persecution and hardship for their faith. Beloved, we're about to enter into that season in the United States of America. And at the same time, there are, I, I describe it this way, there's two parallel tracks that are going to be running at the same time. One is this great darkness that's coming even through, you know, well-intentioned people who believe they have the narrative that all America needs. And at the other, there's a parallel track that's running of great revelation and revival that taking place at the same time. So we need to understand how we fit in all that's happening. How we posture ourselves to pray for those who believe uh, what they're doing and what they're enacting as our government and as our leaders and as people who are, uh, feel that they have become aware of you know, the needs of humanity that is best for everyone, when in fact they're being fed a steady diet of lies. But at the same time, the revelation of the glory of the gospel, which is what we started with as one of our five foundations, is going to be unlocking the heart of humanity like we've never seen before. The greatest harvest of humankind is in front of us. It's in front of us. And we are the people of God who have been invited into a partnership to walk this thing out so that we can invite. Remember, guys, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a hammer. It's not meant to beat people over the head into submission. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to come and see. Come and see how good he is. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's David's description of how good God is. So it's an invitation. Come, come, learn from him. Walk with him, know him, experience him. Salvation is not just for your mind, it's for your whole being. He would not share the message of salvation for your intellect alone. He wants you to experience salvation. And when we do and have, and that's what we carry, guess what we get to do? We get to invite others into that reality. 
You with me? Thank you, Lord. He is God over all. He's the only ruler and controller. When he speaks, the very universe heaves to accomplish it. Natural laws collapse before the sound of his transcendent voice. Human will spend their fight, and then they bow. You know how I know that's true? Because every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that he's Lord. So we are going to come up against some of that opposition. There is a fight in the heart of the enemy, but he already knows the outcome. It's you and I that struggle. We're the ones that need to understand, oh, wait a minute, God is sovereign, he's the one in control, and he has our path clearly set. How could sovereignty speak and it not come to pass? That doesn't make sense. It takes you and I a little bit to process that. It takes a while to see God is God. He's sovereign. To discover that what he promises, only he can deliver. We partner, he delivers. We make ourselves available, he delivers. Here's the deal with Abraham. God never asked for Abraham's help, only his surrender. <laughs> never asked for his help, only his surrender. Father. And here's the deal. Eventually, Abraham learned to pray instead of perform. To wait rather, to, rather than run and to see God and not himself. <sighs> Take a deep breath, beloved. We need to see him so that we understand he's going to accomplish all of this. Not once in your Bible does it command you to build the church. Not once. That's his job. What he does command, what he does invite us into, is making disciples that love and follow Jesus. That's what we get to partner in. And out of that context comes this beautiful creature called the Bride of Christ the church. But it's not the walls. It's not a building. It's not a denomination. It is a people who are called by his name, who come out of darkness, are now standing in the light and the glory of who he is, and are becoming transformed in every season of movement of life. And we begin to sound like him and at the end of the day, we do sound like him because our voice becomes like the sound of many waters, just like his voice. And we've come into complete agreement with every aspect of his sovereignty, including his judgments. You with me? That's Revelation chapter 19. She's now in complete agreement with the judgments of God upon every evil thing that has kept the human heart from knowing God and loving God. We're now fully in agreement in Revelation 19 as we're being introduced as this bride who has made herself ready. <sighs> Where you and I find ourselves right now is in the throes of transformation. <laughs> Welcome to change. If you don't like change, sorry. And formation is not always fun, comfortable, easy, convenient. It's none of those things. It's beholding as in a mirror the glory of God. Knowing the true condition of our life and allowing him to work at those things that hinder us from love and from giving ourselves to his purpose in the earth. That's what we're gonna talk about today. This community called the body of Messiah. <sighs> uh, 
I've been praying for you folks. You're going to get it whacked today. <laughs> you know why we need to get whacked? Because he disciplines every child and whom he loves. Beloved, we need some discipline in our life. It's not bad. It's good. You know? I mean, when my kids were little and they'd come in the kitchen and if I'm cooking on the stove, I say, don't touch that red thing. That's hot. That'll burn you. It'll hurt you. You know what goes through their mind? Oh, I have to experience that for myself. <laughs> and what happens? Screaming, crying, a bubble on the end of their finger, you know, 15 minutes of comfort, some salve, a Band-Aid, and off they go. Beloved, trust me when I tell you, we're in a season of humanity where if we touch that, whoa, feel it. If we touch that that we're not supposed to touch, we may not recover from that. I know people are being shipwrecked in their faith every day because they're touching something that they should not be touching. We're not a people of gossip. We're not a people who give ourselves to darkness. We're people who have been translated out of darkness into light. So our conversation, our thought life, how we choose to do life, it's all different. It has a different foundation, a different root system, has a different understanding of the value of life. We don't value life by our comfort. Come on. We value life because we've been created in his image and in his likeness. And every human form carries that. You and I have been made alive in Christ because we've received the invitation that he's given. And we are now moving and operating in a different realm. And our responsibility as these sons and daughters who are connected to the one who is sovereign is to participate in being a voice of invitation. So I know I'm going to say some things today that may challenge, may whack. But we need to hear them. <clears throat> and we need to embrace the discipline that God wants to bring. So I want to talk about this biblical community. The best testimony to the truth of the gospel is the quality of our life together. Just take a moment and let that sink in. It's not your ability to go out and spout the four spiritual laws. It's not your ability to corner somebody and theologically destroy all of their atheistic arguments. The best testimony to the truth of the gospel is a bunch of people who were lost, broken, wild in their expression of life, and yet have come under the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God, and are now living together in the context of life and their collective testimony speaks to the glory of who he is. That's the greatest testimony to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is our quality of life together. Now I want you to hear this. This is important. Jesus risked his reputation and the credibility of his story by tying it to his disciples and how his followers would live and care for one another in the context of community. Did you hear that? Jesus tied his whole story to those who would follow, who would live this thing out. How do I know that's true? They will know you are my disciples by what? by your love for one another, not your tolerance. Come on. Not your sometime acceptance. Not your, I like these, I don't like those. 
by your love for one another. He risked it all knowing that if you and I don't live a life of transformation, the testimony of our witness lessens the, de the degree of the glory of the gospel. You with me? John 17, we know as the priestly prayer of Yeshua. I believe it's simply the cry of a bridegroom who longs to have a bride like him. And this is what he prays. I'm not asking on behalf of them alone, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their message, through their testimony, how they chose to do life. That all of them may be one, even as you and I, Father, are one. You and me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Listen, guys. The character of our shared life as a congregation, as a community, as families, has the power to draw people into the kingdom or push them away. And we've come to that moment in human history where God has said, enough pushing away. So we're under the discipline of God, whether we believe it or not. If you don't think for a moment that God isn't revealing the hidden lives of pastors and leaders and congregations, you know, whew, come on. And I say, yes, Lord, we need that. We need the purifying of our life before you and before one another. We need the practices of Yeshua in our life as a community. <coughs> this is the proving ground. This is the place where I get to test what I truly believe about who he is, his sovereignty, his goodness, his faithfulness. Hello. How we live together, it's the most pervasive, persuasive sermon you and I will ever preach. Some of you will never stand up here behind a microphone and preach a message, but your life speaks volumes. How you choose to do life with others in this house, it speaks volumes. Our advantage as the people of God in this place, being a part of the church of Benbrook, is that every time we meet, we are reminded that church is not a building, but a community of people called to gather around a common vision of announcing the good news of Jesus Christ in our city. That's who we are. It's not defined by location, name, denomination. We are unique because we are here in this place. And the personality of God in us will emerge and will begin to find that very unique thing that God has placed upon us as a, as a community of people to become a voice to our city, not just through our mouth, but through our collective lives together. Beloved, following Jesus doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's not fundamentally a set of abstract or privately held set of beliefs. Christianity is following the real living Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to learn to do that. C.S. Lewis wrote these words. He said, deep community is not the goal a church should seek. He said, but the results of people living for something greater than themselves produces deep community. Think about it. So what is community? What is biblical community? Well, it's the result, the natural result of a people who are walking in the invitation that we've been given and the provision that we've been given. But I want to give you a definition today. This is how we are going to define who we are as the community of God here in this place. 
We are a group of unified believers following Jesus, motivated by God's love, empowered by the Holy Spirit, supporting one another and holding one another accountable in order to live out the great commandment of loving God and loving others and to fulfill the great commission of making disciples among all the nations. You got it? <laughs> Let me say it again. We are a community of believers who are unified toward following Jesus. This isn't about following Pastor Lynn. He's a servant. He's a great servant. He's a great example and testimony of what it means to be changed by the glory of the gospel. So I can commend him to you and I can say, you can follow him as he follows Christ. You just need to know it's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. So we're unified toward following Yeshua or Jesus, motivated by God's love, empowered by the Holy Spirit, supporting one another and holding one another accountable. Okay, let me just stop there for a minute. Supporting one another and holding each other accountable. You know what that means, beloved? It means that at some point along the way, when we have become dull in our hearing and dull in our sensitivity to who he is, we need someone who will speak the truth in love because we are that unified uh, believer following Jesus, motivated by God's love. We need that one who can speak the truth in love and to say, wake up, stop the self-pity, quit thinking more highly of yourself, learn to submit to the sovereignty of God through his body, through his leadership, who have nothing but God's best intentions for you. Listen, these are the things that we have to hear. These are, the, these are the, uh, the raw pieces that God builds into every community that follows him in this pattern. It's the same, it's the same that we're going to see in a minute in Acts chapter 4 and many other places in the New Testament. Here's what I have experienced after 40 years of doing this. Community itself, the biblical expression of community, serves a greater purpose than mere deep friendship. I've had a lot of great friends, friends over the, uh, the years. But I can tell you the quality of friendship in the context of biblical community runs very, very deep. Why? Why is that? It's because our mission is clear. And our commitment is wholehearted. And we give ourselves to that. And along the way, I become as concerned for you as I am for myself. I begin to pray for you like I pray for myself. I include you in my life like I want Holy Spirit and the Father and Yeshua part of my life. And there's something begins to build of uh, maturity and quality and transformation that doesn't just transform me, it transforms you. And the wisdom that I uh, might need for a moment can come through any one who is yielded. Now here's the kicker, beloved. Even when they've been naughty all week, even if they're one of those people that I don't really like. And yet, you know what my father has done many, many, many times in my life? He brings that person to me. <sighs> Out comes the word of the Lord to me. And I have to deal with it because I'm committed to this. 
This isn't just a lesson to me. This is life. This is who we are as the people of God. I'm not pretending. I'm not wearing a facade. Don't be, don't be uh, confused about the beauty here. It's just, this is me. It's just who I am. I'm his favorite, and you just need to know that. <coughs> I don't want to choke on that statement. <laughs> Jesus frequently sought out times of solitude and prayer. We should do the same. But the majority of his ministry took place in the context of community. He deliberately chose people to surround himself with and to invite them to join him in what he was doing. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 4. I want you to see something. Jesus was up to more than just preparing people to be witnesses to his life and mission. He was intentional about living with a community of friends. I've used a tagline in my uh, emails for a couple of decades now, pursuing God in the company of friends. And it means more to me today than the day that I first wrote it. But there's a redefinition that's taking place in this context of Luke chapter 4. Jesus has come to the waters of baptism. John has declared, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He enters into the water. He's baptized and something phenomenal happens. What happens? The heavens open and a voice is heard. And that voice says, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased, that, beloved, was Yeshua's commission to now go create a family that would be on mission with him. You with me? So here we have this cataclysmic moment in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus makes his way from the river down to his hometown of Nazareth. He's just been commissioned to go on his mission. And what does he do? He returns to his hometown. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Because he has family. Because that's where his family and friends were. Those are the people that he knew. Why wouldn't he go there? It's not some, you know, <laughs> it's not some spiritual reason. He had family and friends there. He'd done life with them. He'd been to feasts and festivals and bar mitzvahs and, you know, all the stuff. So why not go there and invite them in the journey, right? Well, let's see what happens. It's Luke chapter 4. It says, and Jesus, I'll start in verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. And news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Watch out when that happens. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read. And he took the book of the prophet Isaiah that was handed to him, and he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written, and he read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord." And he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture 
has been fulfilled in your hearing. Hmm. What does that mean? And all who were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips, and they were saying, ain't this Joseph's boy? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Wherever we heard, whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your own hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown, but I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came upon the land, and yet Elijah was sent to the house, to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow, and there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the synagogue were filled with rage. Why did they get mad at that statement? Why did they get so angry at that statement? But in the context of this, He's talking about people outside the house of Israel. He's talking about a woman in Sidon, a widow. He's talking about a Syrian general who was healed of leprosy. He gave no mention of the house of Israel in that context, and it ticked them off. It set them off. They were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. Now, who are these people who rushed him out of the city, and were about to throw him over the hill. Who? Family and friends. He's just been commissioned. He knows now he has to go back to his hometown to enlist anyone who would hear, this is my mission. I've been anointed to preach to the poor, to bring good news to the people of God. And then when he gives an illustration that it's also to the Gentile, it's to those outside the house of Israel, they get ticked, they get mad, they go into a rage. Rage is different. Rage is uncontrollable. Rage is when you are not in control anymore. And they run him out of the city and they try to push him over a cliff. Family and friends, come on. Now, I don't know about you, I'd be a little discouraged if I shared a message and my family and friends rushed me out of the city and wanted to throw me over a cliff. A little bit discouraged. Maybe I missed it. Maybe it wasn't the right word. You know, I'd be a little discouraged. But what does Jesus do? He goes down to Capernaum. Why would he go to Capernaum? Because that's where the guys were from who he had just enlisted to follow him. Same reason. There's family in Capernaum. So what is Jesus looking for? A family. So then we have this wonderful little event where Jesus is teaching. The house is so full that people are having to stand on the outside. He's healing. Things are happening. He's sharing the gospel. And he gets word that who has shown up? His mother and his brothers. And someone brings him that news. And what does Jesus say? The most radical thing he could ever say to a Jewish audience. They said, your mother and your brothers are waiting outside. In the culture 
of that day, nothing, nothing takes precedence over that. Your mother and your brothers, your family. And what does he say? Whoever does the will of my father are my mothers and my brothers. You know what he's saying, beloved? I've got a family. In one moment, in one moment, he totally reconstructs what family looks like, sounds like, and does together. Come on. It doesn't take away our responsibility as moms and dads and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles. I'm not talking about that. You need to be very clear of what Jesus is doing. He has shaken loose the very description of what family is. And he has said unequivocally, if you want to be a part of my family, you follow the will of my father. It's tied to obedience. <laughs> you with me? All right. Let, let me pray. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back, and I'll finish. These are important things for us to hear, beloved. I need to hear them. You need to hear them. We are being invited into the family of God to be on mission with Yeshua. And we're going to follow him. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Lord, I'm so grateful today that we get to hear again the truth of your word and that it can come alive in us and begin to wash over us and bring such renewal of heart and renewal of thinking that it literally transforms how we do life in this place. That others would be so attracted to the reality of real life being lived out in this place. A people pursuing your presence, the, the passion for the glory of your gospel. Lord, to live a life worthy of who you are and what you've done to be pleasing to you in every respect, bearing fruit in every good work, trusting, relying upon, living in that context. I thank you, Lord, that that's our portion, and we have said yes and amen. amen. Let it be so in us, in each one of us, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank All you, right. Lord. Take five minutes. We need a spirit of wisdom and revelation and a true knowledge of who he is so that we can comprehend everything that he's up to, everything that he's doing, including our own inheritance. That's what Paul speaks of in Ephesians chapter 1. A spirit of wisdom and revelation. But he starts that whole prayer by praying to the Father of what? Glory. Father of glory. I love that. Especially when you study out what glory really is. <laughs> and you realize that from the very beginning, God's glory is the manifestation of who he is at his core. And he has created us for glory. We're to be those ones who carry the glory of God. So we are this family who's walking around planet Earth who have been created now in Christ, new creations in Christ, carrying the glory of God. Come on. That's pretty good stuff. Oh, what did you do? Technology is great until I touch something I'm not supposed to. Thank you, Lord. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at one of the most familiar passages.
Oh, there's so much we could read from Acts chapter 4. Here you go, Bo. Here's your one heart. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each one who had need. Wow. Wow. Now, we know that they had a general practice. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding. The Lord was adding. Not Pastor Lynn, not Pastor Norm. The Lord is adding to those who were being saved. Adding to our number those who are being saved. Now, beloved, their early expression of these things were shaped by their unity and mission and their commitment to live radical generosity. It spoke to something in their community that was abnormal. It wasn't normal. It's an uncommon love. Right? I mean, how many people bring the deeds to their property, to the church, to the community here and say, hey, let's sell this and give the money to those who need it the most. Not many people doing that. Please, I'm not here to say this morning that uh, we're lesser because we haven't done that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there was such, there was such a conviction that had come upon the people of God in a very short span of time that they were willing to do such radical things that would keep the testimony of Yeshua in its right context. And that is the radical generosity of Jesus in sacrificing for us on our behalf cannot be matched with anything less. Hello. We can't do something lesser than and expect that that's going to create the same result. And you and I both know that there is a world who has been looking at the church for some time and they're looking at our greed. They're looking at our pursuit of comfort. They're looking at our dysfunction. They're looking at you know, the things that we are participating, that they participate in. And the testimony and witness of that has lessened the value of the sacrifice of Yeshua. Come on. So their early expression of this life as the community of God, in the context of being Jewish, you need to understand that. The book of Acts is still about the Jewish people, still about them struggling with religious Jewish expression and now this freedom in Christ who is both uh, gone to and wants to include both Jew and Gentile couldn't be a more polarized group of people. We have you know, racial tensions in America and we are... Uh, 
stupid in our understanding of how to relate to humanity, trust me, has nothing to do with color, has to do with the issue of the heart. But this Jew-Gentile thing couldn't be any bigger. Couldn't be any bigger. So in the book of Acts, what you have is the Jewish people coming to the recognition of what do we do with the, the Gentile people who are coming to faith in Christ? What do we do with them? That's Acts chapter 15. James gets the brothers together and he says, man, what are we going to do? These, these Gentiles are getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're coming to faith in Christ. Now what do we do? Well, you get to the book of Romans. And this whole thing is reversed. The Jews have gone, who are living in Rome, they've come to faith. There's a big Jewish expression of, of uh, followers of Yeshua in Rome. Nero comes along. He expels them all. Uh, I may not be, have been Nero. It could have been somebody else. I don't know why that just popped in my head. Anyways, one of them there, Roman emperors, expels all the Jews, even the Christian ones, even the ones following Christ. So the Gentiles are left to fend for themselves in that context, and they become the leadership in the church. They become those who are now caring for and looking after and creating community and all these things. Well, then the edict falls, and the Jews come back to uh, Rome and now the, the Gentiles are saying, what do we do with the Jews who are coming to faith? <laughs> so Paul, when you read Paul, Paul's letters are all about the dysfunction of our life. It's all about this family who doesn't know how to do this. So he is constantly saying things like this. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Quit thinking that you're better than them because you're Jewish and they're not, or you're an aristocrat and they're poor. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So Paul's very much aware of this broken, dysfunctional, hyper-whiny bunch of people that are trying to live this thing out. He's very much aware. He has no difficulty in maintaining that understanding that I have to constantly write these people and constantly tell them, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. If you read his letters, that's what you get. He's always pushing the church towards the reality of the cross because that's where you and I come and die. That's why we take up the cross when? Daily. Daily. Shoot. Really? I got to die every day? It seems kind of dark to me. But in that process comes every ounce of life I could absolutely ask for. It begins to manifest in ways that I had no clue, had no idea. Paul is calling us to a selflessness that requires us to step out of ourselves and to be mindful of others. And it's a mindfulness that we learn is from the mind of Christ. Have this same mind that was in Christ. But beloved, this type of community doesn't happen without unity and without love. Doesn't happen. Ephesians 4 talks about walking worthy of the calling with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Y'all. This is the same prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be one in us. Paul is simply 
creating the context for now who we are as the people of God and how we're going to live this out. Here's the deal about unity. It's not just for unity's sake, but it's because our mission is uh, compromised when unity is broken. As a family, when a family is broken, they can no longer fulfill their mission as a family. That's hard to hear, but it's true. And so as the people of God, as the family of God, when we're so dysfunctional and we compromise our life in such a way, then we are not fulfilling the mission that we've been given to fulfill. <laughs> you guys look like a calf in a new gate. I don't even know what that means, but that's what my spiritual father used to say all the time. I've never experienced that. I have no idea what a calf in a new gate looks like, but sure has stuck with me all these years. They don't like it. Is that what it is? <laughs> so here's what we're going to do as the people of God in this house. We're going to begin to think in this term, that we are a family on mission with Yeshua. Right? We are a family on mission with Yeshua. When we stop thinking of discipleship as a task and that we start living out discipleship as a way of life, it changes everything. It changes everything. Family on mission is how we stop doing discipleship as a class, as a program, as a curriculum, and we start living it as a way of life. That's what we're doing here. Thank you, Lord. Being missional in our purpose is about listening for the word of Jesus, living in the way of Jesus, and practicing the works of Jesus. It's, it's a very big picture that he's given us. And we live in such myopic tunnels sometime. We can't see beyond the little thing that we're looking through, the peephole of our front door. And he says, no, 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 no. Open that door. Let me come in. I'm going to have fellowship with you, and I'm going to blow your mind as to how big this really is and what I want to include you in. You may have heard me say this before, but there are three essential things about us that you need to carry, that you are known, that you are valued, and that you are included. You hear me? You are known as a son or as a daughter. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. At the end of the day, beloved, you can stand and hear that same declaration. Well done, beloved, my good and faithful servant. You will hear that testimony. But we are known in that context. We are given that invitation to become sons and daughters of God. So we're known in that context. But we're valued. What is the value that you and I carry? The blood of his son. Come on. There's no greater value that we can carry. It's not your intellect. It's not because you're the brightest person in the room. It's because you carry the blood of Yeshua. And he sees that blood and he says, that makes you valuable. Come on. And we begin to see one another through the value of the blood of Yeshua. It changes everything. Your annoying behavior that I don't like takes on a new perspective when I see the value of your life through the blood of his son. Now, I'd love to tell you that, you know, I'm going to automatically respond the way I'm supposed to, but I may not. I may not. But I want to lean into learning to live my life that way, to seeing you in that context. 
And all I ask is that you do the same for me. That you see me in that place of value. And the third thing is that, beloved, we're included. We're included. Jesus went about creating a family that would partner with him in his mission. He's still doing it today. He is alive and active in this house. He is creating sons and daughters who will partner with him in mission to be a voice in our city and in our nation and give testimony to the glory of the gospel in our collective lives. And along the way, you know what we get to do? We get to pray for the sick and see them raised up. We get to pray for resurrection and see people raised from the dead. We get to touch blind eyes and deaf ears. We get to pray for those with mental disorders and, and anxiety and fear and all these things. And we get to watch the kingdom of God come upon an individual. We get to invite them into this family and say, come, taste and see that he's good. He's better than you think. You don't have to live in hopelessness. There's a great hope that anchors your soul. That's what we get to participate in. Listening for the word of Jesus, living in the way of Jesus, practicing the works of Jesus. It's not, again, it's not rocket science. If you're a rocket scientist or you're an overthinker, stop it. Not stop being a rocket scientist, but stop overthinking. <laughs> know, share, and show. I don't preach. I, I might save that for another time. Here's the deal, beloved. Our identity is deeply rooted in family because the basic nature of God is family. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, family. He was relationship God long before he was creator God. So, when we read the book of Genesis, and we read the description of the beginning, and we see the naughtiness of the enemy come and attract man's desires away from God himself to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there becomes this gap, this division between us and heaven. After that, we watch God create a new family. And it begins with a man by the name of Abraham. That's why I started with Abraham. And what does Abraham do? He has to lean into the sovereignty of God because God comes forth with a promise. I'm going to make your descendants greater than the sand on the seashore. Come on. That's ridiculous. Abraham's thinking, no stinking way. I'm an old guy. My wife's an old woman. This isn't going to happen. And we know what Abraham did. He took it upon himself. All you have to do is look on your phone right now. Struggles in the Middle East, and it's Abraham right there. When we don't do things God's way, beloved, that's why we can't touch what we're not supposed to touch. Our identity is deeply rooted in family because the very basic nature of God is family. And if we're going to make disciples in that context, Beloved, we have to do this portion really well because we want sons and daughters who understand these things. Do you remember at the beginning of this journey called Life Walk Weekend, we said we were going to speak to five foundational truths. Do you remember what they were? Glory of the gospel, identity, right? Community, mission, and living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Those five things. Now, there are other things that we could teach on. There's other things that we could do. But we said these five things we want to have as a foundation 
together as the people of God in this house. We want to live this out with such passion, the truth of those things, that it begins to transform us and our city. And we're watching it happen one weekend at a time. The more we do this, the more we want more, right? This is just the beginning. But beloved, we're at number six of ten. Come on, we're at number six of ten. We're on this beautiful journey together, and he is producing something in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. It brings him pleasure when we show up and we give our hearts to him, we say, God, we want the more. We want to do this more. You've also heard me say that there are two themes woven through your Bible. Remember what they are? Number one and number two. Remember what they are? Covenant and kingdom. They're woven through the scripture. Every story, every example, every testimony on one side or the other speaks to those two things. The covenant of God is how he chooses to do relationship. So you and I are in covenant with Yeshua. But beloved, because of that, we're also in covenant with one another. We don't understand it because we don't live in that culture. We live in a culture of broken commitment. We can't even keep a commitment. But we live, actually, in the realm of covenant, and covenants are not broken. They're not. We keep them. We honor them. We serve them. That's how it works. So this issue of kingdom and covenant that he's called us into, both relationship and responsibility... He's called us to be this propelling expression and voice in the earth of these two realms, these two things, covenant and kingdom. And we don't have enough time today, so I'll probably add uh, some more of this particular topic next month. But you and I have to learn to honor the covenants of God's heart how we treat one another, how we serve one another, how we love one another, the testimony of Yeshua in our midst, how we bend low in humility when it comes to our relationships one to another. Listen, we're not going to be without problems. We're not going to be without issues. We're not going to be without conflict. But if we're covenantal, you work through until closure until release. You're committed to the process. You may not understand. You may not even agree. But we can come to the point of closure that I can speak blessing upon you. You can speak blessing upon me. And just so long as you know I'm right and you're wrong. That's all that matters. <laughs> yep, I just took it all away, didn't I? Just in one fell swoop. <laughs> oh, Father, help us. <laughs> We're a family on mission. And we have to learn what that means. It's not that you and I are going to create all this extra work. That's not what I'm talking about. We're going to learn how to become. And when we do that, the transformation happens and the work gets done. The kingdom of God expands. And he's responsible for that. That's his job. Add to the church those who are being saved. But there should be a sound that people hear of the testimony of Yeshua in this place. I want this place to be known, obviously, for signs and wonders and miracles, his presence. I want all of that. But I tell you what will light me up is when I'm on the outside of this place and I hear the testimony that somebody says they really love themselves in there. They love each other in there. Man, that'll light me up. Because that's what Jesus said we would be known by, that they love one another. You with me? All right, let's pray. We're right at 12. going to... Eat some food and serve our community. Doesn't get any better. <laughs> Thank you, Lord.
Father, there's so much treasure here. There's so many things that we want to discover, the joy of discovery. And we need you, Holy Spirit, to take us on that journey of discovery. Lord, there are things that are yet hidden even in our own hearts that we're unaware of that have been blockages and things, mindsets and uh, thought patterns that have hindered us from truly uh, walking in the fullness of these things. Well, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're dismantling those one at a time so that corporately we can become the people of God who love well, serve well, and live well. Lord, that's our desire. That's our desire. Uncomplicated, walking in the simplicity and purity of devotion to you, honoring one another, blessing one another, blessing and serving our community, and watching the kingdom of God explode. Lord, we know that the seasons of humanity are growing short and your return is imminent. And we want to be that people who long for, who look for, and to help hasten your soon return. And we're going to live with great joy. We're going to live with great hope and expectation. We're going to live with great faith to believe you for the impossible and the improbable, even in the midst of, of doing life together. And we're going to watch you perform it. Because you have chosen our path. And we say yes and amen to everything that you're doing and that you're working inside of us as the people of God in this place. And we thank you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen.